1918, my parents were 17 years old. In 1918, the party Solidarity was elected in Poland, the first free election in Eastern Europe for 44 years. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. In the global war of authoritarianism versus democracy, a major battle had been fought, and democracy came out, for the most part, victorious. It was such an incredible time of hope. There was such belief that in the following decades, democracy would go on to deliver democratic values and make our world a better place. 30 years on, living as a 17-year-old in today's political landscape, and things feel a lot less optimistic, a lot less romantic. When I look at the news, I don't feel like a victor. I feel overwhelmed by pathos at the figure of Theresa May, scraping the mould off her jam as another of her trade deals is rejected. It's to see the President of the United States engaged in another meaningless Twitter war, trying to persuade us that his red button is the biggest. It's to see, instead of communist dictatorships, we have far-right authoritarian political parties gaining power and momentum across Europe. And it's to see that elsewhere, new walls are rising. What happened to those values, to that hope, to that belief? Well, I'd argue that it was at least partially unfounded. Because the values that so many ascribe to democracy are not inherent within it. All democracy means, if one looks at pure etymology, is the people, demos, having the power, kratos. And generally nowadays, we consider that to mean individuals having the right to an equal vote. And when you think about it, it's clear that this alone does not guarantee freedom, equality, or justice. Equality in voting does not translate to equality in society. Freedom to vote doesn't translate to freedom from oppression. Majority rule gives us no assurance of justice. So in asking how best to create a free, just, and equal society, democracy has a role to play, but is far from being the whole solution. One of the other most important constructs in such a society is education. To quote Kofi Annan, knowledge is power, information is liberating, education is the premise of progress in every society. If the public don't understand the issues at stake, then quite simply, they cannot vote on the issues. Instead, they will vote on the personalities, on the sound bites, based off of often misleading rhetoric or occasionally out of short-term self-interest. Even in Athenian times, when democracy was very much in its fetal state, they understood the importance of having a well-educated public before they were put to the vote. And so the, the roughly 10% that were allowed to vote were required to take part in a public debate, listening and engaging with the arguments at stake before they voted. I don't think there could be a more painful or stark contrast to our own democracy than through the most Googled question in the UK the day after the EU referendum, asking, what is the EU? In a climate increasingly characterized by post-truth politics, it is my sincere hope that mandatory political education would enable substantive issues and genuine debate to prevail over repeated misleading assertions to our emotions. Democracy aims to place power in the hands of the people. Well, knowledge is power. To place that in the hands of the people requires education. For that very reason, history is replete with examples of those in power in dictatorships, in monarchies and religions, resisting education for the masses. Because information is liberating. It both promotes and facilitates debate and inquiry. It leads to challenging the system and the vested interests. To challenge the system, we must understand it. And we must understand what we vote on, or our vote is meaningless. So, schools have been having a, a hard time of it today, but I would continue that trend by arguing that we need better political education in schools. I had one citizenship lesson in school that taught me about democracy, and it taught me very little. The rest, I know, comes mostly from my own interest uh, and my own research. I spent far more time in school memorizing equations that I've already forgotten than attempting to understand our political system. To me, that isn't right. There's something else that many people argue for that I would also argue for, 
Um, and that is a voting test. Um, it wouldn't need to be based on IQ. I think that's critical, in fact. It mustn't be. But it should be based on a simple understanding of the issues that are at stake. And if we cannot bring ourselves to do this, then at the least, I would say, we need a compulsory informational video to be played at polling stations before we have a vote, so we have this basic understanding of what we are voting for. Whatever it is, education is the linchpin of a successful democratic society. However, it is not the only construct needed to support one. Once we have this power in the hands of the people, we must decide how we exercise it. Whether we have a direct vote on every issue, or whether we vote for a representative to decide on issues on our behalf. Going back to Athenian times, they had this true direct democracy. And I think it was best criticized by Socrates. He compared democracy to a ship, which could clearly be better managed by a ship's captain than by a vote from the passengers as on what to do. And this argument and many of his others surrounding democracy were rather painfully vindicated by his literal death at the hands of democracy. Because Socrates was killed by a 54 to 46 percent vote. He was executed by a few percentage points, killed by a populace afraid of his challenges to the system. <coughs> the truly terrifying thing is that we do not seem to have learnt from this. Even today, our politicians are happy to throw the highly complex uh, economic, political question of Brexit back to the raw public. To me, appropriate representation is key to ensuring that democracy is not abused. The exact logistics of how we exercise this representation are, of course, far more complex. But whatever it is, we mustn't forget it. The thing is, neither education or representation are new ideas by any stretch. They've been expressed countless times before by those with more experience, credentials, oratory skill than I, giants whose shoulders I merely hide behind. The reason I stand here today and attempt to reiterate these tired arguments is because despite all this, the arguments still stand. And that is because what they criticize has remained largely unchanged. Change is vital in any system. Humans have been and I think will always be challenged by certain questions. Questions that resound throughout sciences, uh, philosophy, the arts, religion, questions that we're bound to through our very humanity. And the question of how best to govern a society, how to live together in equality, freedom and justice is amongst these questions. Since for the most part the questions do not change, it's our answers for them that must change if we wish to achieve progress. And there is no system in which change is more important than in a system concerned with power. Power rather famously corrupts. Revolutions become dictatorships as those who have power cling on to that power. Without enforced change within a system, it cannot help but fester and eventually disintegrate. And our own system certainly seems to be festering. Look at the Houses of Parliament. MPs still bodily walk through corridors to cast a vote. The structure itself is riddled with asbestos and broken pipework. Within its seeping and dignified halls, MPs squabble and jeer as speakers shout to the rabid masses. And these quaint traditions have consequences. Because of the obscure language used in the chambers, procedures are only transparent to the chosen few. Because you have to physically walk through a lobby to cast a vote, voting takes six times as long in the UK parliaments than in the European parliaments, where voting is done electronically. And this means amendments, changes to the system, take six times as long to happen. To me, this decaying building full of rotting ideals and traditions represents perfectly the decay of democracy. There has been pitifully little change in a system governing a country that has leapt from the post-war era and into cyberspace. Because today, our democracy faces new challenges it has never had to face before. I think the perfect example is social media. Social media has become deeply entangled with modern politics. Fake news pursues us at every turn. Politicians squabble on an all-too-public stage. The rise of instant news has led to the rise of instant reactions from our politicians. And this means that their, their knee-jerk reactions are broadcast to the general public instantaneously, who all too often seize upon these and broadcast them, amplify them with their own similarly ill-thought-out commentary. Even when politicians are given more time to tweet, 
it's of little help to democracy. Social media was never built to be a platform for debate and integrity. What social media leads to is celebrity worship. People begin to vote based not on, on policy, but on personality, on popularity, or, at the worst of cases, how you eat a bacon sandwich. Statistics show that tall men win more votes. Humans can't help but be influenced by appearance, by image. And social media enhances this out of all perspective. It's very easy currently to blame this on tech giants, such as Cambridge Analytica, and I don't deny that they've had a terrifyingly anti-democratic role recently. But merely taking them to court ignores the issues that they fed on, issues that still remain, because we, we still find echo chambers developing, personality politics growing, most importantly, and fake news spreading. So I think there's one simple solution that I would propose, um, and that is to ban politicians from having a public social media account. I think that would be simple and would go a great step to, uh, to cutting out at least half of the issues I, I explained there. I, I would personally go so far as to allow each party three leaders throughout the campaign period, and only once that party had been elected could they choose one as prime minister. I don't claim to have the answers. I'm not sure these are the right ones. But whatever the answer is, we need one, because whilst education and representation are the most important pillars to stand as part of a democratic society, Ultimately, they are redundant if we do not have a system that is capable of change. Whilst I may have appeared to have spent much of the speech railing against democracy, much as I fear that the great ship of democracy is steadily sinking, I don't think it should be towed off into the sunset yet. It's worth acknowledging other ships do sail these seas. We're all aware of China's economic prow looming over us. Depending on your criteria, there are more successful governments out there. And yet, I find myself compelled to agree with a true giant of the political and oratorial arena, Winston Churchill, when he says, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. <laughs> and to me, this quote really perfectly summarizes that whilst, sort of admittedly, democracy is the best form of government we know of, it is not perfect, and by no means should we venerate it. Because since long before 1989, we have, we have championed democracy in our own country, promoted it, and at times enforced it in others. We have admired the noble statue and failed to realize that its foundations are crumbling. Democracy is by no means perfect, and I'm not sure that it ever will be. The values of equality, freedom, and justice that I keep mentioning may never be truly delivered, because our systems can only be as perfect as we are, and we will continue to be in perfect humans, in an imperfect world. And yet, despite the tragedy of our inevitable failure to realize these values, we must forever strive to come as close to those noble values as possible, because that, not merely democracy, is what is needed to make our societies fit for the future. Thank you. <laughs>